Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is award-winning investigative reporter Bob Mackin. He's the publisher of TheBreaker.News. His website, TheBreaker.ca. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Thank you. Bob, it's been eight years since Vancouver hosted the Winter Olympics. In fact, uh, you know, I was part of the reporting team for that for CTV's radio division, 127 countries getting my reports. 18-hour days, one of the most exciting things I ever covered. But a lot of questions still remain about the Vancouver Olympics. For example, you point out the Auditor General never did do a report on it to find out did we get value for our money. I remember the Australian Olympics, I said the cash would have been better spent on schools and hospitals. Uh, what have you found out about the financials, and will we ever find out what really happened? Well, yeah, the, the, the Olympics were a fun time for a lot of people, others not so much. Uh, it's still a big questions because Calgary is exploring a bid for the 2026 Winter Olympics. Uh, Nahid Nenshi, the mayor, was actually over in Pyeongchang, to uh, take a look at the setup in Pyeongchang. The IOC is desperate for cities to bid, so they've changed their bidding process, and there's no more bidding war, and there's even a school of thought that they might even possibly award the 2026 and 2030 Olympics at the same time in 2019, just as last year they awarded the 2024 and 2028 Summer Games to Paris and Los Angeles. So the financial records are locked up in the Vancouver archives until 2025. That's according to the deal that uh, Vanock cut with City of Vancouver. They arbitrarily chose 2025 as the year when we could finally take a look at the financial documents as well as the board minutes. So I find it very interesting that uh, Calgary could throw its hat in the ring and get the Olympics and we'd finally get to look at uh, the deep financials and the board minutes of Vancouver a year before, which would be too late for people in Calgary to put a put brakes on the whole thing. Um, the, the Olympics has become, in many ways, a very large racket. We've seen very large corruption among the International Olympic Committee. Uh, the last Olympics, uh, Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, was a disaster financially, a disaster from uh, government uh, integrity point of view in Brazil. It happened during a recession down there after the oil industry fell apart. Essentially, it really hurt Brazil and hurt their their way of uh, putting it on. They, they, they got the games uh, together. Uh, it happened. But a lot of people aren't happy because there's still a lot of poverty, third world style poverty in Brazil, and uh, a lot of people don't even get clean drinking water. So the International Olympic Committee, the five rings used to be the most trusted uh, logo in the world, the most ubiquitous logo in the world, not so much. They're, they're very much tarnished. And actually, I've been looking around Vancouver at various retail outlets to try to find the Pyeongchang 2018 logo. It used to be that uh, companies that paid the big bucks to be global sponsors, even national sponsors, would get the chance to use the logo for the upcoming Olympics uh, on their products. And that's changed. Uh, uh, I, you can't find, I couldn't find any Coca-Cola cans or bottles with the Pyeongchang logo on them. I found uh, Coca-Cola boxes that wish me and wish everyone else a happy Chinese New Year. Uh, Coca-Cola didn't have to pay anyone to use the Chinese New Year uh, insignia, but they paid dearly for the Pyeongchang insignia. And I think what has happened here is that there's probably been some uh, market research that has caused them to put the brakes on it, that... Uh, the Olympics are no longer the golden brand that they used to be, and we're seeing that at retail level. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, this hurts the athletes, the athletes that train their whole lives, blood, sweat, and tears, to try to go for the gold, the silver, the bronze, to try to make our country happy and proud. 
And uh, if the athletes aren't able to uh, get the profile they need and get the support they need, the only other way to get the support is through our tax dollars. Bob, you also pointed out that uh, deadly luge crash just before the Olympics Open in Vancouver. No coroner's inquest. True. That, that's uh, another situation. The coroner did a report, an investigation on that, released it in October 2010, called it an accident when uh, Nordar Komatoshvili, 21-year-old from Georgia, flew off his sled uh, on the last turn at the Whistler Sliding Center and uh, crashed into a steel pole. Uh, he died about an hour later. The the coroner never did uh, an investigative hearing. Often the coroner's courts are convened. The coroner is an interesting agency because they're not a, a, a fault-finding agency. They're a fact-finding agency. Their job is to uh, find the facts when a death happens and bring those facts together along with recommendations of the coroner's court to prevent another incident from happening. And as long as there is a sliding center in British Columbia, as long as there's one also in Calgary, as long as there are high-velocity, high-risk sports, uh, I think it was a major mistake not to have that. Uh, but because they did not have a coroner's court hearing, that means people involved in the construction of the Whistler Sliding Center, people involved in the maintenance of the Whistler Sliding Center, people involved uh, in the construction, current operation of the sliding center, never were held accountable. They were never asked tough questions about how it all went down. And I think we're going to be asking questions for years to come. In the current uh, edition of the Breaker.News, I've got a two-part feature, a comprehensive feature, where I interviewed uh, Terrence Kozakar. He was the medic first on the scene that tried to save the loser on February 12, 2010, uh, never commented really despite the best efforts of all the medical staff, Terrence Kozakar and all the others, the ambulance service, the doctors at the Whistler Athletes Village Polyclinic died an hour later and left a real stain on the whole event and a uh, cloud over the Whistler Sliding Center that uh, will never come off. In fact, uh, they have made some alterations there. There was a safety audit uh, after the games. Uh, they, they moved the men's start down immediately to the women's start, uh, which means there's less time for, uh, I mean, more time for the athletes uh, on a slower speed. They won't attain the speeds that they were attaining, but there still are a lot of questions about uh, how this could have happened. Uh, it is a dangerous sport, yes, but athletes don't die at every Olympics. This is, this is such a rare occurrence that... Uh, there, there had been a death before the Olympics on the Olympic track in 76 at Innsbruck, Austria, but there hadn't been one until Vancouver on the opening day, the last training session. And uh, when that happened, the aftermath was for Terence Kozakar, the medic, that uh, he developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, his he had a descent into personal hell, essentially, of uh, painkiller addiction, street drugs, abuse, um, he had uh, depression, and uh, it was not a good time for him. He didn't get the care he needed, and he also didn't get the tools he said he needed before then. As a medic, as a firefighter, he was never told what the warning signs might be uh, to prevent onset of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that was 2010, we're in 2018 now, and the issues of mental health, mental illness, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder among first responders, those are now mainstream issues. Um, and if there was to be another Olympics in Canada, we only could hope that they'd be better prepared to make sure that uh, those first responders who are on scene at Olympic venues where there could be traumatic injuries are better equipped, and that if there are traumatic injuries, that uh, there's an intervention there pretty quickly to make sure that they get the help they need. Because Terrence Kazakar told me that the only time that it, anyone ever suggested he get some help was a couple of days after the tragedy when a doctor from Van Ock passed him uh, casually walking along a walkway at the Whistler Sliding Center. Uh, he says that she flipped uh, him her business card and said, uh, if you need to talk to anyone, call me. And it was as quick as that. Um, it, 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 so there was more than one victim of the February 12, 2010 tragedy at the Whistler Sliding Center. And uh, the good news is Terrence Kozakar has turned his life around, and he's become a campaigner 
to take away the stigma of PTSD and uh, to tell the world what happened on that day and what happened to him in the days, months, and years after that. He has a uh, wilderness camp uh, near Lillooet, B.C. called Camp My Way. That's where he hopes to make it a worldwide destination for first responders who need to get away from the sirens and get uh, back to nature among the serenity so they can find themselves again so they can lead normal lives. We'll have more with Bob Mackin right after the break. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology, replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Mackin. Bob, do you think Premier John Horgan of BC is doing a good job? Well, there's a lot expected of John Horgan after the way the Christie Clark era ended. And I don't think he's delivering on many files as fast as he should. Um, there is also a lot of pent-up demand for change. I mean, he, he, this is a politician who came to power promising a better BC politician who also a number of times um, uttered the words that help is on the way. And this is a province right now that is hurting in many ways. Um, cer certainly the economy uh, in general is a lot better than other places in Canada and the world, but not everyone is sharing that prosperity partly because this economy isn't so much uh, about the resources that uh, we've relied upon in BC in the past, or ingenuity. There's no large companies that are opening up and uh, hiring thousands of people. This is all foreign money. This is this is money from, from China that uh, there's good, the bad, and the ugly attached to it. We've seen the ugly, the stories about the money laundering at casinos and the connections to the illicit uh, drug world and how that has also affected the real estate market. And the real estate market is really why John Horgan got to power with a lot of people changing their votes in Vancouver to the NDP from the Liberals because of the housing issues. Everyone seems to know uh, the, the empty house down the street, um, and uh, we see the very expensive cars with the uh, L signs and the N signs on them, and we see more uh, Chinese uh, signage around the lower mainland. Um, Canada always has been welcoming and should always stay welcoming to uh, people who want to come here and be part of Canada, be part of uh, the mosaic. Uh, you should never close the doors to them. But there's a lot of questions about uh, what kind of people we're letting in. Uh, if they're coming in on 10-year visas, bring a lot of money with them, uh, buying houses to park their money, and then going somewhere else, and therefore taking uh, supply out of the market that could be used for Canadians who want to work for their livings. So the budget coming up, John Horgan in the uh, throne speech, uh, basically signaled that there will be changes, there will be some taxation measures to deal with the real estate market, there's going to be measures to deal with uh, the uh, money laundering in the real estate market. Uh, this will be his chance to shine. Uh, additionally, there are a lot of people out there wanting social housing. Uh, a, lot, a lot of things that were really neglected over the years by the Liberals. The NDP is under pressure to deliver. And uh, I don't think we can pass judgment yet on John Horgan per se, but uh, at the same time, hasn't been fast to deliver on a lot of promises. And uh, time is running out because uh, there's still a lot of his supporters who are unhappy with Site C being given the green light. That's kind of split the NDP, but uh, the budget day could be a turning point, uh, a time for John Horgan to get back on track and fulfill those promises that they were making last year. 
Well, we have an interprovincial trade war going on, Alberta refusing B.C. wine because B.C. is doing everything it can to delay the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline from going through. That is a, a very interesting dynamic because here you have uh, two NDP premiers at odds with each other, two NDP premiers that are trying to uh, work on two different strategies, one pro-development, one anti-development, to try to cater to their base. Uh, this is something that even after Site C was given the go-ahead by Oregon, which pleased the union members but didn't please the environmentalists under the NDP tent, uh, this uh, strategy to do whatever they can to prevent uh, Kinder Morgan from expanding its pipeline is something that puts a smile on the face of Andrew Weaver, the Green leader, who is the reason why the NDP enjoys power right now because of the minority government situation. Uh, of course, across the Rockies, you've got uh, Premier Rachel Notley, uh, who is under pressure because there's an election coming up in that province. And uh, breathing down her neck is... Jason Kenney, uh, who has reinvigorated the progressive conservatives since becoming their leader, the former uh, Harper-era conservative MP, has really put uh, Rachel Notley on notice. And Notley is going full speed ahead with this campaign against the BC NDP. Got the headlines regarding the wine boycott, but uh, that's not where it starts or ends. They're, they uh, are continuing with a very aggressive communications campaign, very heavy on social media, a letter-writing campaign. They're trying to do whatever they can to uh, uh, stress that uh, this project was approved federally and that uh, BC shouldn't get in the way. BC is doing whatever it can to try to get in its way. Uh, and this is something that, uh, that Prime Minister Trudeau really needs to uh, get in there and... and uh, and mediate some peace between these two provinces. It really looks bad, but then again, does he really want to mediate peace? Because uh, this could be helpful for him in the 2019 election. Uh, and we know politicians don't always do things with the public on their mind, often for their party on their mind. And wouldn't, wouldn't he love to waltz into that election campaign in 2019 and say that, well, the NDP, uh, which runs things in a top-down uh, method, that uh, two wings of the NDP are fighting amongst each other, and, and why should the NDP under Jagmeet Singh, the new leader, be allowed to govern Canada if uh, it can't get uh, its own house in order and can't sing from the same song sheet? So I think Trudeau is taking a back seat on this now because he wants to uh, let uh, uh, the specter of NDP infighting continue. Um, and this is a, an interesting dispute because, again, this has been approved by the federal regulators. There's been questions about the integrity of the federal regulators, but the federal regulators have approved this. This is uh, a, a project that, because it got the federal stamp of approval, is one that's in the federal interest. And uh, that's what uh, Horgan and NDP are fighting on uh, and are hoping to fight to the courts and get a judge to hear them, whether a judge will agree is another standpoint because uh, this is ultimately a constitutional disagreement and uh, you know pipelines are federal but uh, Horgan's going to try to say well he's trying to do whatever he can to protect provincial lands and the provincial coastline. I think another area where this gets interesting is uh, Washington State in the, in the United States because uh, the, uh, the tankers will have to go through American waters and go close to American waters and they might have something to say about it at the end of the day, about the potential for any spills there. Uh, this isn't going to end anytime soon. And uh, the one thing that we hope doesn't happen, though, is that this turns into uh, uh, a violent confrontation. We saw what happened in the 90s with the war in the woods uh, when environmentalists tried to save a lot of B.C. forests. And there eventually was a mediation that happened and was a truce. Well, will we see that happen here? Will, will this develop into uh, mass protests and maybe even violence? Well, talking about constitutionality, Alberta argues B.C. doesn't have the constitutional right to block them exploiting their natural resources. And also with Alberta's boycott of B.C. wines, there's already been a court ruling in Atlantic Canada. It was illegal to charge a New Brunswick man for importing Quebec beer 
because the BNA Act that made Canada says there shall be no restriction on interprovincial trade. So both yeah, that, both provinces that, have a constitutional argument here. Yeah, that, that was an interesting uh, interesting one back in uh, uh, in, in Quebec. That, that was a fellow that was uh, uh, or the, the Maritimes. He, he was actually not, not buying uh, actual Quebec beer. He was buying one of the big brewers' beer and taking it across the border. Uh, a real backwards law that is to protect uh, one province's liquor from another because each province has their own monopoly. Uh, this could open up a lot of other uh, opportunities too because each province has their own uh, lottery monopoly and they're not supposed to compete against each other but uh, they, they have their own provincial monopolies and some of these provincial monopolies are actually, help, actually helping other provincial monopolies as well. Um, yeah, this is a strange uh, situation in Canada where we do have uh, these provincial trade barriers. Um, there are only 10 provinces and they should work in uh, harmony because uh, one resource can help another province and uh, you know BC does rely on Alberta oil to run uh, you know, run business here to run municipalities uh, I mean there's no suggestion yet by not really that she's going to turn off the taps uh, that would uh, not be in anyone's best interest uh, Kinder Morgan of course wants to expand its uh, its ability to trade overseas to send Alberta oil over to China, which is kind of interesting, too, because the irony that uh, Alberta's premier has told the private company which distributes alcohol under license from the Alberta government not to stock B.C. Uh, wines anymore, yet the same company is still supplying Alberta liquor stores with uh, booze from China. And uh, China, of course, is uh, not Canada's diplomatic friend. They're a trading partner, but uh, they're not uh, an ally of Canada. And it's also a country which uh, is rife with uh, human rights abuses. It's a country which uh, does not respect the rule of law, does not respect freedom of speech. So that's another, another aspect. You've got uh, uh, an NDP premier sticking up for uh, an industry which is wanting to send its product to a country which uh, is becoming uh, another superpower in the world, which essentially does have worldwide domination on its mind and not on its mind the welfare of its own people. So you've got all these different aspects uh, behind the scenes, these uh, gray areas, these geopolitical questions that are rearing their head uh, during this uh, very interesting debate. We'll have more with Bob Mackin right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Mackin. Bob, are the Greens and NDP still getting along in the BC legislature? Well, that's an, that's an interesting one. Um, in many ways, they are because uh, Andrew Weaver is getting a lot of what he wants, uh, and uh, in some cases, holding his nose when uh, John Horgan does something that uh, is not uh, up to his liking. Uh, there was that one uh, flaring up earlier this year when John Horgan went over to China, uh, Japan, and Korea on a trade mission, and uh, part of that was to talk to companies that want to, uh, or may or may not want to, uh, or have been looking at the possibility of importing natural gas from British Columbia through the LNG program. Andrew Weaver uh, stood up and uh, said that uh, that was something which could cause the coalition to collapse or the alliance to collapse. It's not fully a coalition because uh, they haven't coalesced. They just work together. Um, they're, they're holding hands, but they're not actually in bed together, uh, as it were. So, you know, that, that seems to have calmed down because uh, Horgan was able to appease Andrew Weaver with this uh, anti-Alberta oil stance. Um, and uh, Weaver has put the brakes on a few NDP policy proposals 
uh, the the ten dollar DDA care and the four hundred dollar uh, rental supplement. Uh, those promises from the NDP have not uh, blossomed yet because uh, Andrew Weaver uh, poo pooed them. Uh, they, they do have a secretariat. They're spending about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in uh, the government communications office for this uh, NDP Green Secretariat, uh, where the the uh, staff help uh, enable the, the Greens and the NDP to talk to each other at all times to share policy and share announcements uh, as part of their agreement, uh, their supply uh, agreement and uh, confidence agreement that the uh, Greens will support. NDP throne speeches and the Greens will support NDP budgets uh, until the next election. Um, I think in many ways that uh, Andrew Weaver is still trying to, sh to offer an opportunity, offer something else for those British Columbians who uh, don't want to vote uh, or aren't going to support the, uh, the NDP, um, and also offer an alternative to those who uh, don't want to go back to the Liberal Tent yet. Uh, new Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson is not new, capital N new, because this is someone who has been in the Liberal tent for a long time. He's a former Liberal Party president. He was elected uh, in Vancouver, Colchina, under Christy Clark and served loyally to Christy Clark. Uh, he had uh, worked in the office of Gordon Campbell as a deputy minister uh, before going uh, out of government and into the world of lobbying. What he has done so far is uh, interesting that uh, he demoted Rich Coleman and demoted Mike DeYoung from the shadow cabinet, uh, at least the public facing side of the shadow cabinet. Uh, Coleman and DeYoung still could have a role behind the scenes as the elder statesman of the BC Liberal Party, but uh, Rich Coleman was the interim leader. He decided during the leadership contest to support Mike DeYoung's leadership ambitions, and that was a very strange situation because normally the interim leader of any party stays neutral and does not get involved in endorsing any candidate, but Rich Coleman decided to uh, pat Mike DeYoung on the back and uh, appear in a campaign video for him and uh, encourage people to vote for Mike DeYoung, who eventually lost the leadership, uh, lost the second leadership that he participated in. And Mike DeYoung himself, who was the House leader, is no longer the House leader, uh, that goes to Mary Pollock. Um, this is a signal, at least from Andrew Wilkinson, that he wants to do things differently and allow some new faces in, especially Michael Lee, who did have an impressive showing in the leadership. He was not successful in the leadership, but uh, he did bring a uh, newer voice in, despite having so many ex Christie Clark cronies in his back room of his uh, uh, leadership campaign. So. He, Michael Lee is the new critic for Attorney General, so you'll see him in question period uh, quizzing Attorney General David Eby, and that could get uh, get interesting. Both of them are lawyers, and uh, uh, you know this is a chance for the Liberals to start start anew. But it's not the major overhaul or makeover that we we're expecting. If Diane Watts had won, she was the only outsider. Uh, the only non-caucus member to join the leadership race, and I think that was a bit of a commentary, too, that Liberals weren't able to attract any brand new blood to their fold, to their race. Um, she lost on the last ballot to Andrew Wilkinson, the fifth ballot in the leadership uh, race on February the 3rd. Uh, and the fact that it went five ballots also showed that uh, people in the Liberal Party as well had we're, we're split about who should be their new leader and weren't all unanimously supporting uh, Andrew Wilkinson. It was uh, uh, kind of a split. But uh, we'll see if they are reinvigorated or if they can uh, overcome the problems that, uh, that they caused because the NDP has already reminded the province of the quote-unquote dumpster fire that ICBC became, a, a monopoly auto insurer which... Uh, became the cash cow for the Liberals who took money out of ICBC's profits and put it into general revenue so they could artificially balance budgets and keep taxes low. Uh, we're paying for that. And uh, the situation with BC Lottery Corporation and the money laundering that uh, happened under uh, the BC Liberals' watch, um, and as well as the situation with the, the sale of uh, land, of provincial government land uh, from 2012 onward, that uh, doesn't appear that the British government got top dollar for the land. 
Uh, did they give sweetheart deals to party donors, or did the party donors who bought the land just get lucky as the real estate industry boomed? So there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of material there that the NDP will be able to use against the Liberals under Andrew Wilkinson as things go forward. As much as the, uh, the Andrew Wilkinson Liberals will do whatever they can to try to knock the, uh, the NDP off uh, off their trail. Is Diane Watts likely to stay in politics? Well, that's a good question. Uh, there, there has been some talk that maybe, maybe Rich Coleman or Mike DeYoung, probably Coleman before DeYoung, might decide to pack it in and call it quits. Uh, if uh, Rich Coleman did, uh, he represents the Fort Langley Alder Grove riding, which is not far from Surrey, where Diane Watts made her name as the mayor and later a conservative MP. Uh, she could easily win that. That's uh, that's one of those areas uh, in British Columbia which is likely never to go NDP, even with the change of demographics and uh, people moving out from the city into the country. Um, that, that, that's that's an opportunity there. There's been some talk that maybe she'd try again to return to being the mayor of Surrey. Uh, Linda Hapner doesn't enjoy uh, unanimous support of her own people in Surrey. And there's been some questions about uh, her ability to be a strong mayor. Uh, could Diana Watts decide to uh, to throw her hat back in the ring in Surrey and return to her old uh, old office? That's something that uh, we'll be asking about in the months to come. Um, you know, she could always find something else to do as well. But I don't think she's uh, finished quite yet. I think she still has something to offer, and we see a lot of politicians... Uh, who are invigorated by being in politics, by the attention that they get, um, by the public and by their donors and by those in industry. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of addicting. They love the cameras, they love the glow, and I wouldn't be surprised if Diana Watts, uh, either runs provincially as an MLA or returns to, uh, uh, run for the mayalty in Surrey. Uh, keep an eye on it in the months to come. I, I don't think she's a spent force at all. Are there any likely candidates to run for mayor of Vancouver? Well, that's that's an interesting one, especially with news this week that Kirk LaPointe has decided not to run. Uh, he had a very impressive showing in 2014 as leader of the NPA. The NPA in 2014 uh, took a majority of, of uh, park board. They got uh, almost half of School board, uh, the Greens held the balance of power, and Vision got uh, the other, the other uh, block on school board. It was uh, quite a comeback, and uh, the, the NPA under Kirkwood Point also eroded Vision Vancouver's power on City Council. Uh, he came short by about ten thousand votes, but but got more than seventy thousand votes. It was an impressive showing. There was there were a lot of uh, suggestions during the campaign of uh, irregularities, voting irregularities. Uh, I got a number of calls and did a few stories on certain situations about the integrity of voting during the campaign, but the NPA never contested it afterwards. Uh, they just took their lumps. Uh, now, LaPointe was, uh, was an aggressive debater and uh, capitalized on notoriety of a story that I wrote about a, a fundraising scandal about how Vision Vancouver went to the uh, outside workers' union and uh, convinced them to write a big uh, campaign check in exchange for a promise that uh, if Vision Vancouver won again, that there would be no contracting out of work. Uh, the NPA, under a critical point, charged that that was uh, a corrupt, corrupt uh, promise that was made. Vision got so worried, and their polling showed that they were in trouble in 2014, that uh, two things happened. They sued uh, LaPointe and the NPA for defamation, that was later settled after the campaign. Uh, never got to court. They also had Gregor Robertson go on CBC during the debate, and uh, it, he jumped in near the start with his apology, an apology uh, to Vancouverites who felt that uh, Vision Vancouver wasn't listening. And Robertson promised that uh, if he got reelected, that Vision Vancouver would turn over a new leaf and be a kinder, gentler party and would listen to people. And uh, that didn't happen, of course, but he did get, uh, another four years of power. So, quick uh, point is uh, as a surprise. There's a number of people that are looking for uh, the NPA nomination. The only one who's expressed interest so far is Glenn Chernin, who's a Dunbar resident uh, who is uh, known for questioning authority. He has questioned uh, the BC assessment process. He has questioned uh, Vision Vancouver land deals. 
uh, with donors and supporters. Uh, he is uh, he's, he questioned the tax uh, assessment for Oak Ridge Center, which is going to be redeveloped over the next couple of decades. Uh, he is someone who uh, says he wants to clean up City Hall and corruption and, and waste. He's the only one who's uh, gone out and said so far that he wants to be the nominee. There's a possibility that Hector Bremner might uh, run for the nomination for the NPA. Now, he's someone who got uh, voted onto City Council in the by-election last fall. He uh, defeated Turnin for the nomination. But uh, Hector Bremner has only been on City Council since October. Uh, he hardly has the experience uh, you know, that's necessary to be the mayor. Uh, he came out from under the shadow of Rich Coleman and Teresa Watt. He was uh, their uh, aide in the BC Liberal government before becoming a lobbyist with the Pace Group. Um, Why Young, the former Vancouver South Conservative MP under the, the Harper years, has been exploring a bid. And she actually had a fundraiser last year. Um, would that baggage from being in the Harper caucus uh, be enough to turn voters away from her? Uh, there, there's also been rumors about Michael Lee, uh, who mentioned earlier, ran for the D.C. Liberal leadership, didn't win, but uh, impressed a lot of people. Uh, would he uh, walk away from his uh, MLA seat in the D.C. Liberal opposition to run for the mayor? Um, he's someone who has a political network. He's got a database now. He's got supporters. He's got donors. He's got a political machine that was built for him in the D.C. Liberal leadership race. Would he, uh, uh, you know, fill up that tank and uh, let it run again to try to get the NPA nomination? That's a question uh, that will be answered eventually as well. Uh, could there be other uh, candidates out there willing to throw their hat in, or could there be not? Uh, this is also a very interesting time in the history of Vancouver because of what happened during this uh, almost decade of Vision Vancouver. Who would really want this job? Uh, this is a city that is... Uh, uh, dealing with so many challenges, uh, whether it's uh, the white-collar crime, uh, the money laundering in the housing market, uh, whether it's, it's the deplorable conditions in the downtown east side, uh, the lack of uh, housing solutions despite the promises of Vision Vancouver. There's uh, the extremes of Vancouver. Uh, Vision Vancouver uh, and their legacy uh, will not be undone anytime soon. And who really would want to spend all that time, walk away from their career to try to fix this. Is there someone brave enough out there? Let's hope there is. Bob, is Vancouver Mayor Gregor Robertson under investigation? That I would like to know if he is. I know that some of the some of the policies that and programs that uh, Vision Vancouver has done are under investigation. There is an investigation into the Brenhill deal, the deal in Yaletown where a developer called Brenhill uh, cut a deal to swap land and uh, it, it uh, agreed to build a new social housing development in exchange for taking some of the land from a nearby park downtown so it could build luxury condos which have been marketed overseas to China. And uh, Bob Rennie, who was on the BC Housing Board at the time of this, he apparently recused himself from the votes, but uh, he was on the BC Housing Board at the time, uh, became the marketer of this project. And, of course, Bob Rennie was, until recently, uh, the fundraiser for Vision Vancouver and the fundraiser for the BC Liberals, uh, someone who had access to both uh, Gregor Robertson and Christy Clark, as well as Rich Coleman, uh, there was a story that was published in the Vancouver Sun last spring uh, during the provincial election uh, that that uh, confirmed that uh, there was an investigation of some sort. Uh, the RCMP uh, was acting upon the complaints made by the aforementioned Glenn Sherman, uh, who wants to run for NPA mayoralty, uh, that he had uh, assembled uh, documents that showed that there was uh, something wrong with this deal, that uh, the the people involved in this deal uh, had basically given away this land, had, had undervalued this public land, and cut this deal that involved people that were close to uh, both the uh, Vision Vancouver and Liberal parties. So that is under investigation. Um, other aspects of uh, what Gregor Robertson might be investigated for, I'm, I'm not sure what that might be. 
Uh, we will have to see, but uh, as we saw with the recent Brian Bonney prosecution in court where he pleaded guilty to breach of public trust, uh, David Butcher was the special prosecutor there looking at the Quicklin scandal, and he didn't just look at the Quicklin scandal, he looked at how Christy Clark became the leader of the D.C. Liberal Party back in 2011 through uh, uh, various interesting means of proxy voting with uh, PIN numbers in the uh, online and phone election for the D.C. Liberal leadership. Well, what else could he be looking at uh, in his other investigation, which is supposed to wrap up pretty soon? He was hired as special prosecutor to work with the RCMP to investigate the phenomenon of indirect donations by lobbyists to political parties. Most of that money was to the BC Liberals, liberal lobbyists who put their names on their donations but didn't put the names of their clients on those donations. What else could Mr. Butcher have found in his investigation and could there be an intersection with Vancouver City Hall? Because again, you've got the very interesting connection between Vancouver City Hall and the provincial government until last year, of Bob Rennie being the chief fundraiser, Bob Rennie being the most dynamic uh, marketer in the uh, condo uh, industry here in Vancouver, and also someone who was appointed to provincial boards. Uh, there, there appears to be uh, many questions that uh, could and should be asked by the police, whether it, these two investigations intersected in any way, I'm not sure. But I know that one of the detectives uh, who uh, was working on the Glenn Churning complaint uh, was also in court uh, during the Quick Wins, uh, Brian Bonney uh, sentencing hearings, uh, a detective named Nicholas Cotton from the RCMP. Uh, I know that, that uh, what goes on at Vancouver City Hall and what goes on in the provincial government uh, are on their radar. We'll see, have to see what uh, that might be when uh, David Butcher uh, submits his recommendations to Crown Council eventually and see if Crown Council agrees to uh, any charges against any uh, appointed or elected officials, whether they're civic or provincial. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. My guest has been Bob Mackin. He's an award-winning investigative reporter. He publishes TheBreaker.News, his website, TheBreaker.ca. If you have any questions for Bob or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.